this episode, please consider making a donation to the podcast via Venmo to the username at NQCATX. Hello and welcome to Next Quest Podcast, where I ask your potential therapist questions so you don't have to. I am your host, Noah S. Garcia, Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor. Today, I welcome to the show Grace Secker, Licensed Professional Counselor and Registered Yoga Therapist, who will be discussing her practice and area of specialty, the intersections of psychology and yoga. Welcome to the show, Grace. Thanks, Noah. I'm excited to be here and really excited to talk about this topic. Awesome. Me too. I'm excited to learn more. Um, So to get us started, what are your credentials and experience? So I am a licensed professional counselor as well. I am a registered yoga teacher, about 500 hours, and currently going through training as a yoga therapist. I should finish that up in September. Nice. Oh, yeah. I've worked in various mental health hospitals as well as eating recovery center for, I worked there for around a year and a half and eating disorders is a large part of my practice as well. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the name of your practice? Evolve Therapy. I co-own it with another therapist. It's just us two right now, um, actually hoping to grow um, this year in the future. But that is, yeah, Evolve Therapy, our practice. To be determined. (laughs) Yes. So um, at Evolve, do you accept insurance? If so, which ones? If not, why not? We do. We have private pay and offer right now limited availability for United Insurance. It's the only one we take. Okay. Do you have a sliding scale or reduced fee schedule of some sort? At this time, we don't. Insurance is mainly our sliding scale. Gotcha. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you have any weekend or evening appointments available? We do, depending on the time. That's also another reason we're wanting to grow so we can open up some more evening and weekend availability. Right now, we don't have weekends, but there are some evenings available. Cool. Mm -hmm. Is being a therapist your first career? If not, what was? Yes, it is. I have actually wanted to be a therapist since I was in high school and went through my own therapy. So after high school, I went straight to undergrad for psychology. And then from there, I went to get my master's in counseling. Very cool. What is it that ultimately drew you to being a therapist? I know you just mentioned like your own therapy. Uh, Mm -hmm. Would you mind telling us a little more? Yeah, for sure. So I, in high school, I was in a girls therapy group as well as individual therapy. And it became something, the thing I looked forward to most every week, it was the space that I could feel most comfortable. I could feel accepted. I could feel like I could talk about anything where normally in my everyday life, I I did not have that ability. I was working through, through some depression, anxiety, some trauma as well. And so I was in that therapy all throughout high school. Um, The therapist actually became a mentor of mine. Eventually I went back and co-led some of the group in grad school. And so it was, um, it was a very special place in my heart. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, tell us a little more about yourself. Like, what are your hobbies, interests, TV shows, music, pets, etc.? So I would say probably my number one hobby, which is also my, my self-care, honestly, is being outside, getting outside at some point, somehow, whether that's literally sitting in my backyard, playing with my dog, Addie, and, or we're going for a walk, or I also love to travel and adventure to national parks or anywhere else around the country or world, honestly, that I can get out and explore not only nature, but different cultures. Um, it's pretty important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, any type of movement as well is a hobby of mine. I'm usually doing something, whether that's literally just stretching or walking, Pilates, cycling, something along those lines. It's one of the biggest forms of self-care I've, I've realized for myself. Cool. Do you have any favorite local nature spots? I do. There's one trail that's out west, northwest. Um, it's actually, well, it's actually not a trailhead. It's close to a trailhead that I found. So it's not as crowded, but it's close nice. to Turkey Creek Trail. Um, and it's one of my favorite places to go. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so in your practice, when you're working with clients, what modalities do you tend to draw upon? I draw upon, I like to say I'm eclectic in that. Um, I draw upon interpersonal, internal family systems, mindfulness, ACT. I also have been through a training that wasn't necessarily therapy focused, but it combined therapy and spirituality. It's called the feel good life methodology. I use that very largely in my practice. It's kind of forms the basis of how I think and perceive it focuses on the nervous system as a tool to help us understand ourselves better. So you can take that as it is, and then you can go much deeper into it, into spirituality if you'd like, but I, I just use it depending on who's in front of me, honestly. Cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. So in terms of yoga and psychology, in what ways would you say they intersect? So, um, First, I'll say that yoga focuses on really our inner work with ourselves as well as our unity with the universe. The primary focus is to be at peace with oneself, to become accepting and being aware of who you are in this moment. Now, psychology is the study of behavior in the mind, the unconscious and the conscious, as well as thought. The way that those intersect is they both also focus on emotional healing and thought process. So um, they both try to understand patterns of behavior, although psychology is going to be much more about um, using us individually, understanding our individual differences. So we can understand our unique patterns of thinking and feeling based on our family of origin, based on our past experiences, a lot of in-depth work there. And so by combining that with yoga, which focuses deeply on being at peace with oneself and understanding accepting us in the greater whole too. It's a lot about, okay, let's, ex- let's see what else is, you know, what else is out there. We are not the only people in this universe, right? We're the only person, sorry, in this universe. So let's see how we can connect with others and we connect um, in the universe as well. So really to combine the two, I think is beautiful. Um, a lot of my training in the past also comes from kind of Buddhist psychology and yoga is more Hinduism, but all of that together combines to really sit at the seat of how am I being aware of myself? How am I acting towards others? How can I be a little bit more peace and accepting of that? Mm -hmm. So basically it's a body, mind, and spirit that's being addressed. Yes, exactly. Mental, physical, spiritual, um, behavioral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, What specific skills or strategies from yoga can be utilized as tools for mental health? And what specific physical, cognitive, emotional, spiritual, and social benefits have been shown from this? So that's a long question. (laughs) (laughs) It is. Um, But I'm going to focus on, really, I'm going to bring in the nervous system because one of the main components of yoga is to start to become more aware physically of your body and relationship space, which is called proprioception. So if we can become more aware of not only what we feel, 
not only what we think, but how they interact, like you were saying, mind, body, mind, body, spirit, then we can, I mean, if we're aware more of that, then we can work on changing it if we need to, or being more accepting of it, whatever really we need. So with that in mind, um, one of the physical practices would be restorative yoga. That's going to be much more therapeutic. Um, the yoga that we think of, most people think of in the Western culture is going to be going to an hour class or now it's going to YouTube and finding a yoga <laughs> class on YouTube um, and whatever length that there may be and doing certain physical poses. Um, but that's actually just one limb of yoga. That's just one mm -hmm. aspect of it. There's technically eight limbs of yoga. So restorative is one of those physical practices. And so when we talk about it therapeutically, that's probably more of what people think is a restorative yoga practice, which really truly allows your nervous system to balance and your body to relax while your brain remains in a state of alert observation. So some people may think that relaxing can be anything and it, and it can, right? But if we're relaxing and maybe watching a show, your brain is still active, still thinking, but to really, truly relax the nervous system, yoga says to relax the mind into a slow uh, brainwave state. It helps us react less intensely to our thoughts and our emotions and to regain your balance more quickly after they pass. So that's the physical part of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's also breath work, which helps to recognize how we can increase our exhales that relaxes the nervous system as well. I usually say, this is something probably most of my clients have heard me say that if we think of, if you're in the anxiety stage or even depression, your breath is probably going to be pretty restricted. Your chest might be tight. Your throat might be closed up. So you're not getting enough oxygen to your body. And when we don't get enough oxygen to our body or our brains, it doesn't function properly. So breath work is the most important in my, in my opinion, <laughs> to, um, to start mm -hmm. working with. So really in the beginning, it's just working with how can I increase my exhales? How can I use my breath to relax my muscles, to relax my body that will help relax our emotional state. And you mentioned, was it, did you say eight limbs of yoga? Is that the yes. terminology you used? What, yes. what are the others just out of curiosity? Yeah, for sure. So um, and let me think if I get this right. The yamas and niyamas, those are two. So those are going to be, one is working with personally how we react towards ourself, um, our perception, how we think of ourselves as truthful towards us and towards others. The other is going to be other focused, like how are we in the world? How are we in service to others? How are we going to be in service to our family and our friends? Um, then, so that's two. Then there's physical asana, um, the physical practice that we know. Pranayama, which is another word, the yoga word for meditation. Um, I'm sorry, that's breath. Pranayama is breath. And then pratyahara is meditation. Um, and technically in yoga, meditation is, we, it's not necessarily meant to be just absent of thinking. It is becoming aware of whatever is there, whatever is there in the moment. We don't have to become this Zen person to be a yogi. Um, and then the last one is Samadhi, which is, um, their state of enlightenment to be fully mm -hmm. at peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, the meditation sounds similar to like mindfulness. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, a common misconception with yoga is that you do have to be this in per Zen person, right. Or this at peace person to experience it. And it's really not, it's, it really is truly mindfulness. It's being able to become present in the moment with whatever there is. It doesn't matter if you're angry, if you're sad, whatever it is, it's how can we have a certain relationship with that and let it come and go. And, and sit with it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What about like a chanting? I've read that there is like numerous benefits from chanting. What, what can you tell me about that? Yes, for sure. Chanting is, um, it's not necessarily a limit to, it's a good question. It's a part of it. It's a, it's a skill. It's a um, tool. Tool is a better word. So chanting, and I, I actually just took one of my courses in yoga therapy is about, um, part of it is chanting. It's about voice and using your voice at sound, sound therapy too. So anytime we chant, we utilize our vocal cords. And also there's vibration that happens in our body. 
And I'll just so you know, this isn't my specialty, but I'll tell you what I know about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there is a vibration that happens in that sound is a certain frequency in our body. And just like I was talking about the brain waves, we want the brain waves to be at a certain frequency for relaxation. If we invoke that vibration within us through chanting, it can evoke that state of relaxation as well. So I don't know if you are, yeah, or if any, anyone listening, if you've been to a yoga class or somewhere there at the end, a lot of times the common chant will be Om and they will chant three Ohms at the end. I remember the first time I did that in a class years ago, I remember being there and being really shy in the beginning and didn't doing it, didn't do it at first. And then when I did, I felt, I felt that vibration. I felt that calming come over me. I remember thinking, oh, wow, this is pretty powerful. I'm really curious, you know, I, I can't remember. Was it the week before last, I had uh, another guest on the podcast who talked about hypnotherapy and how, you know, hypnosis essentially changes our brain waves. And I, I'm just, I'm not expecting an answer to this. It's more of a rhetorical question. I'm just curious as to the differences in brain waves during the relaxation in hypnosis versus brain waves that happen, you know, with, with like yoga and those sorts of things. I wonder if it's similar in any way. I, I'll have to do some research on that. <laughs> well, that's a good question. That is curious. I would assume because they're um, like, I can see it in my head. I almost wish I had it up. There's a chart of the certain brain waves and to be at a state where there is feedback, um, it's not completely unconscious, but you're not fully conscious. There's like a sweet spot in there. And I bet that's where that hypnosis happens, but I don't know either. Um, I remember something about theta waves, I think. Uh-huh. I'm not sure. That mm-hmm. sounds familiar. Theta, theta, and delta, and alpha. Um, yeah, there's different ones. Cool. I'm certainly going to have to do some research because I'm just so curious about this. And, and thank you for the information on that. Yeah. For sure. um, so you just mentioned the eight limbs of yoga. I'm aware that there are various different types of yoga. Um, are there any specific types of yoga that have been shown to like help with certain things? So there are, there are different physical um, practices of yoga, but really traditionally in the yoga tradition, there are around four to five different types of yoga, not in the physical form, but in the Uh, philosophical spiritual form. So there's karma yoga, which is the path of service action and good of others. So you're going to practice putting your service towards others and how that helps you as well. Bhakti yoga is termed heart yoga. So that's really where we see a lot of that self-compassion, heart-centered space, um, as well as connection to the universe, the divine spirit, whatever you want to call it. Um, Yana yoga is the path of intellect and wisdom and includes a lot of the self-study that yoga talks about. So the self-study is huge part of yoga. And the whole idea is if you practice this, you'll be more at peace, right? You will understand yourself better. You'll understand others better. And then Raja yoga is what they call the Royal path refers to the journey toward personal enlightenment. Um, and it integrates the three stages that I stated before. And then there's Hatha yoga, which is the basics of physical yoga. Physical yoga um, combines vinyasa, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, There's the hot yoga um, that people are familiar with. So there's multiple different physical ones, but those are the original philosophical ones. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, One that I I had been, I had done some research on some types of yoga and I don't remember what I read about, but I can say that I, I remember being like, hmm, if I did yoga, I think I would do like Kundalini. I think, mm. I think I said that right. Yes. Yes. Kundalini is the, um, there's a lot of breath work in Kundalini, breath work and meditation. Um, you're not going to be moving at, well, you won't be moving traditionally like you would think in a, in a, a yoga class, but there are some arm movements that you do as you breath, as you breathe. Um, cool. that one can be really powerful and it, um, if you're not used to it and you go straight into a class, you can almost get a little lightheaded because you're not used to the breath work that they do. It's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how does yoga impact us physiologically? 
And how can these physiological changes positively impact an individual's mental health? I, I mean, we talked about brain waves and the such, but what, what else can you tell us about? Yeah, so I did, yes, we talked a little bit about the physical components of it. The more that I would say on that is that really, truly, if we are in a state of, um, I'm going to go back to the nervous system for a minute. So um, the way that we'll take anxiety or depression, for example, if we are prone to more anxiety or more depression, our fight, flight, or freeze response is going to be triggered really easily. If we can, and I'm going to call that the stress response or the red zone really is what I say to just simple, simple form. Um, that response speeds up whenever we're in a state of arousal. And so yoga physiologically helps us to calm our mind, to calm our nervous system and get us down into that relaxation response a little bit quicker because we're more aware of our body's sensation and our body's physical state. So a lot of times I'll tell clients this too, is that sometimes like when you're in an anxiety thought spiral and your thoughts are just going, 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 you can't always stop them with another thought. You can't just change it. But if we can focus on how it's manifesting in our body and what our sensations, if we're feeling like tight or shaky or hot or something is tense, we can work on those body sensations with the breath, with mindfulness so that we can calm the body and then the thoughts will start to calm as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a way to work with both. Got it. Got it. So we know that unprocessed trauma is often stored in the body. How might yoga help with this? When we experience trauma, we have a tendency to become disconnected from our bodies because that is truly where the trauma lies. So some people might be dissociating to avoid the pain and dissociate from their body. Um, we see this a lot in eating disorders as well. You try, even though we may think that eating disorders focus solely on the body, a lot of times they're very disconnected from it. They don't want to feel what it feels like to be in your body. Um, there can be a lot of trauma there. And so slowly, but surely if we can start to have a little bit more body awareness, we can start to work with opening that trauma and being with it instead of avoiding it. Cause the more that we avoid it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to go away. It just means that it's going to get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, we can reconnect more to the present moment and potentially dissipate those sensations that create that uncomfortable feeling when the wind trauma is present, which is really when the nervous system is overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of uh, trans people or, you know, anybody with any, you know, gender expansive uh, gender um, has a tendency to dissociate, right? Because I don't want to be in the body I'm in, right? For sure. So, and, and that's related to the experience of gender dysphoria. So I, I'm wondering, you know, and there's a lot of debate within the community about more somatic related uh, like therapy strategies and working with the trans community. Um, how might that maybe look a little different for somebody who is trans? I would imagine, and I'll say this, what I would assume, because um, it's, it's not my specialty area, but um, the similar way that I would work with eating disorders because they don't want to be connected to their body either is it's very slow. It's very relational because I have to work with them to recognize, okay, what is it like for us to even just acknowledge what one sensation in your body? Sometimes that's too much. Sometimes we take it back and we go to something else and then we come back to that at a different time. So I would think that there needs to be some kind of relationship right? When it's appropriate, when that time is appropriate, too much in the beginning might be too much. Um, but to focus on reconnecting with your body, having more acceptance of it, even just body neutrality. That's usually where I start off with people just having some type of acknowledgement of your body that isn't negative saying that, okay, I have a body I have, it's here, it's there. It's here with me. Doesn't mean I have to love it. Doesn't mean I have to like it. It's just here. So there are, it's a, it's a, gradual few steps that I would say that we get to eventual awareness, acceptance of being in our bodies and being in those sensations. That's where I have a little bit of trouble with that is, you know, 
and working with trans clients, Mm -hmm. you know, we, the goal is not necessarily to accept your body as Mm -hmm. is, Um, you know, because that's, that's what in and of itself um, causes distress and, you know, is one of the reasons why people desire to start like HRT, get surgery, all those Mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, I don't know. There's just, I I can't quite, I don't quite have the the language to explain it right now, but there is something to me about just acceptance that doesn't sit right. I would imagine that you're right. I mean, that's going to be a pretty hard thing to accept if the whole idea is not being comfortable with the body that you have at this moment. Yeah, right. For sure. Um, and, you know, the, within the community and talking about more somatic and body focused, uh, you know, techniques and strategies and working with the, the trans community, there are some people who are of the school of just no. Um, and then there's other people who um, have been able to successfully work with folks by making modifications to perhaps maybe the area of the body that is focused on, for example. And, you know, I, I don't feel one way or the other about it because uh, you know I don't want to say that that precludes trans people from being able to do any sort of you know body work um, because you know everybody's different so I don't want providers to just be like oh you're trans can't do that you know because what Mm -hmm. if that person is actually an appropriate candidate and they're somewhere in their transition where that would be beneficial Um, so I that's kind of where I stand on it so The use of yoga in therapy sounds similar to other types of somatic-based interventions. Um, Mm -hmm. How does yoga complement and or differ from other somatic-based interventions? I see it as pretty similar. Um, You may not have the word somatic in it. It is very body-based. So, um, you know, the, the little that I know about somatic experiencing is that they really truly are similar. There's basically just kind of different skills that you use. Um, and yoga therapy, for example, you're going to be inundated with a few different like mindfulness, meditation, breath work, physical postures. So those are kind of more tactical skills that you would use. Now I know there are some tactical skills in somatic experiencing as well, although it's, that's not my thing. So I don't fully know all of it. Um, but I see them as very similar. It's, we even talk about somatic therapy in my training and understanding how to bring more of that in because that's so much of what we're doing. Um, we're working with the sensations in the body to help process whatever emotional trauma or even just emotional experiences that are there. And going, going back to that regarding the unpro- unprocessed trauma, um, mm-hmm. like how, how might yoga help work out that trauma? Like what are there specific like poses or is that dependent on the type of trauma or kind of, you know, give me a little more information there. Um, probably is a little, actually, yes, it's a little dependent on the trauma. Um, there are certain poses I probably wouldn't do with some people that might have sexual trauma, for instance. Um, but there are certain body parts that are associated with certain emotions. Like the hips are usually, um, signify deep emotional, actually kind of any emotion, but sometimes a lot of anger there. So anytime they're doing deep hip postures, there's, um, some caution around that. If you know, this person is going through something, if it's a therapeutic setting, um, let's see. So anytime that they're, you're opening up your chest, the front of your body is open in a posture. That's going to be more open and and receiving, right. It's not going to be as like comforting, So anytime in, maybe if I'm working with an anxiety client, I would probably put, use more props, maybe more blankets or bolsters. And I might do more grounding postures, meaning like feet on the ground or hips on the ground. Um, Grounding is more safe and comforting. Being up and open is going to be something that I would use with a client that might be more depressed where they need to open up their space and their body and Mm -hmm. their mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I love that. I, the, the whole idea of, you know, working through and out trauma from the body is just fascinating to me. 
Mm -hmm. It is. It is fascinating. And I feel like I'm actually just at the very beginning of understanding and learning about it because it, I mean, I haven't been doing this long. I'm still in the training, but it is, um, it makes, it makes sense to me. It's, it's, I think it's always kind of how I've worked is somehow with my mind and body connection. So it just is what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So what sorts of mental health conditions and or issues have been shown to benefit from yoga? So there are studies that show that depression, anxiety, PTSD in particular, trauma, ADHD, those are research to show that benefit from honestly any kind of yoga. Um, I would say, because I'm a little biased, that disordered eating and body image as well um, can benefit from it. But again, it looks, it definitely looks different. It's, it's not the same. Um, it's sometimes a little bit trickier. We have to figure out more ways to do things. Um, but in terms of mental conditions, those have been um, researched to work with yoga. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any possible contraindications to the utilization of yoga in a therapy setting? I would say first and foremost, it's really important to acknowledge where the person is in their life with their, what they're coming in with their, whatever issues or emotion, emotions or mental um, problems they're coming with anytime they, how, how open they are. Um, the number one thing, at least for me is just meeting someone where they are. I don't want to have an agenda or an idea of what is going to, what protocol is going to work best because each person is, just, is different. Sometimes if we maybe push a certain sequence or pose or try to take them in a deeper meditation, it's not deeper, better. It's not deeper equals better or faster. It's really more about um, what do they need right now in this moment and really trying to understand them as a full mental, emotional, physical person. Mm -hmm. What about any like physical or medical concerns that might be contraindications? Mm. Good question. Um, honestly, it's, it's hard to say anything in particular, especially um, I will say that the training I'm going through um, through my vinyasa practice here in Austin, and she is extremely, the owner is extremely careful. And her whole point in this is offering yoga to accessible um, anyone, anyone, any kind of yoga is accessible yoga. And so we learn a lot about how to work with what's called adaptive yoga, adapting to any type of situation or concern. Now, that being said, at least for me, if there's something that I haven't worked with or it's not something that I know a lot about, I will for sure refer out. Um, but I don't off the top of my head literally know that, okay, I know these, these few mm -hmm. things I, I shouldn't touch or shouldn't work with. Okay. So say somebody's had like a history of like a knee injury, for example, mm -hmm. that necessarily wouldn't like be a reason why they couldn't do it. No, not at all. And honestly, it would be, I would say it's a reason to do it. Um, anytime we have an injury, say it is a knee in injury, I wouldn't want to avoid it. I would want to learn how to work with it. So how do we modify certain things to help that individual become more, um, maybe even stronger in the knee as they rehabilitate, right? So certain postures we can maneuver in different ways and help them get into with that injury instead of just saying this posture equals this way. There's so many different ways to do each posture. Do you have a favorite specific practice within yoga? Mm, probably in the physical practice, it would be vinyasa. That's what I learned. That's how I originally went through training for. Um, now the traditional vinyasa practice where it's a flow movement to movement to movement. I would say, to be honest, I don't do that as much anymore. I am much more of a, a slow flow um, practice person. I kind of just do my own thing these days. Mm -hmm. um, but first and foremost, that's, that was my training. That's, that's my, that's my yoga. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. um, what are some common misconceptions about yoga, uh, both individually by itself and, and as it relates to psychology? I love that question. Cause there's so many, <laughs> and I like to <laughs> like to talk about them. Um, so there's a big misconception that 
the yoga is only physical, right? That's all we really fully know. I had no idea there was more until honestly, I went into the training. I took the training without really fully understanding what I was getting into. And so that's probably the biggest one is that it's only a physical practice. Um, another one is that you have to be flexible to do it. You need to be this bendy, flexible person. Um, when again, like I said, and depending on the teacher and the training, so much of it is about modifying and be accessible to anyone if they're open to it. Um, another one kind of, like I've said before, is that you have to be Zen to do it. You have to have this peaceful mindset and you have to sit and meditate and have a blank mind. And that's definitely not the case at all. The whole idea is to learn to sit with whatever is there and to have the constant practice of thoughts coming in and out and being able to sit there with that. Um, I'd say for how it relates to psychology, probably that if I'm doing yoga therapy with a client, at least for me, I integrate it a lot. I probably honestly looks a lot more like therapy than it does yoga. Um, I don't really do a whole lot of physical practice with people. The main, the most, the main aspects I do is going to be um, meditation or breath work. Um, sometimes I'll recommend some physical postures, but I haven't fully gotten to the full yoga therapy setting where I would do that with someone yet. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked about yoga and psychology that you think would be good for people to know? I would say maybe not necessarily a question, but more so um, comment or statement is that I've, I've gotten feedback before that it can be a little intimidating to maybe go into yoga class or just even to open the box of yoga. Um, there's a lot of conceptions out there of what it is. And so I would say that if you are interested, um, look up a couple different studios around you, see what kind of classes they offer. If you're, if you're thinking more, you want more of like the, the soft therapy setting. Um, if you actually want to work through something, look for a yoga therapist. And I would say, ask them about their credentials, ask them what their experience is, what their specialty is in that area. Um, you're I think not, that's definitely important for people to, to look into. Yes, for sure. Um, because even though it's termed yoga therapy, a yoga therapist is not trained in psychology. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to be able to go there and process the family of origin and trauma with you. So I would say um, if that's something that interests you, look into it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, switching gears a little bit back to, to you as a mm -hmm. person and therapist, uh, what kind of experience do you have working with particularly vulnerable clients such as those who are transgender, undocumented, or BIPOC, to name a few examples. So, um, I, to be honest, I don't have a whole lot of experience in this. I have been doing some training and work in, um, in different populations to make sure that I am, whoever I do see, that I am appropriate to work with them. If I don't feel I'm appropriate to work, I do have other therapists that I refer to. Um, that would that are able to handle whatever client comes into play. Cool. Yeah. What could a new client expect from an initial session with you? And what about it on, on an ongoing basis as well? So an initial session with me, it would look like us really establishing a strong relationship. Um, I know that can't just happen in one session, but in the beginning, it's really establishing um, comfortability, making sure that they understand that it's a safe place for them to express what they want. It'll be a lot more probably me asking more questions to get to know them and their background and really what they're looking for. And we establish some goals that we want to work on in therapy and some ways that we may possibly, some areas we want to go in. Um, ongoing, as I as I stated earlier, to me, it really truly is about where they are on that day in that moment, or even just in that time in that month, one month of therapy may look different than the next month of therapy. We may need to do a lot more of talking and discovering more about their patterns or relationship patterns, their family one time. And then the next month might be a lot more of present 
maybe mindfulness or understanding what's going on just with them um, in that moment. I love dealing with stuff in the moment. That's, it's so, so good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, You know, because I found in my experience when, when you have an agenda, it never goes the way that you had planned. So, you know, I, long time ago, I realized you just, whatever is happening in that moment, that's, that's where you go because that's a, that's what's important then. Um, so yeah, I totally feel you on that. Um, kind of a difficult question, mm-hmm. maybe not. How would you say your clients uh, would describe or experience you? It's hard to imagine ourselves like on that other side. It is. And it's funny because answering this, I'm thinking, well, is this how I want to come across or is this really truly how I come across? Um, I think it's probably a combination of both, I'm assuming. Um, Probably attentive, down to earth, nurturing. um, Because I do have a background in yoga and spirituality, um, I can tend to maybe be perceived to be a little um, out there in holistic nature, but I like to think of myself as really down to earth. And, um, I used to say I'm a spiritual realist. Like I can really acknowledge when it's appropriate and when it's not to introduce this. And if it's even, if the client even wants that, Mm -hmm. um, but whatever comes, I'm pretty present oriented with it. Um, I'm realistic in nature. Cool. Mm -hmm. This, this next uh, question has been a, co- a bit controversial in the past. Um, are you a therapist who will laugh or cry with your clients? Mm-hmm. Yes, I would say more so laughter for sure. Uh, I make it a point, I mean, if it's appropriate, if the, if the context is there to laugh in probably most of my sessions, even if it's just in the beginning, you know, or um, a little side comment or something, um, I think that's, it makes us more real. And it mm-hmm. establishes that relationship as well. I don't see myself as um, kind of this standalone structure that is has a blank blank wall, right? Um, I'm me, and I bring a certain flair to the therapy session. Crying, I don't as much, and I think that's also just because, just personally, I am not someone that cries a whole lot. Um, like I don't cry as much at movies. Although lately I have been crying a little bit more at the show that we're watching. Um, but in general, um, it is different to me, at least in a therapy session, I, I won't cry, um, with my clients. I think that I would rather hold that space for them. Which brings us to the next question. How do you define holding space Mm -hmm. for someone? That is a great question because we say it all the time, right? Um, and, and we all mean similar but different things. Mm-hmm. For me, I think holding the space means the ability to meet someone where they are that day, their life, um, being open, not judgmental to anything that they have going on so that they feel safe and secure to be in this session with me and to express whatever they need to express. Um, holding that space, I think, is the most important part probably of therapy um, so that they can open their heart. Yeah, for sure. I I like that definition. What is the best advice you've ever received from a supervisor? Hmm. Probably get out of your own way. (laughs) The long line, (laughs) I have, there's, I can get in my head about something that I want or something that's going on. And more often than not, if I were to relax into it and just, just be me, things will go as they need to. So I've, I've heard that a couple of times from a couple actually different supervisors is you're just, you're getting in your own way. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Mm-hmm. What have you personally learned about yourself and or the world through your practice so far? That's a big question. Uh, I first, when I first want to say everything, I've learned everything. <laughs> Everything that I know right now in life, I have learned through um, my practice of therapy. Um, But more specifically, I've really learned how to look at myself and become aware of my patterns and interactions with others. 
um, relationally has probably been the biggest growth factor for me. Um, when I think that I have an idea of who I am and how I'm relating in the world, just get in a relationship. That'll, that'll show you more <laughs> about yourself than you ever thought. So, um, learning to be more at peace with myself is probably the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I know earlier you mentioned, you know, one of the ways you take care of yourself is, you know, through spending time in nature and uh, generally being active. What about on a cold rainy day? What are you likely to do to take care of yourself? Being cozy. I do. I do love being outside, but I am someone that finds comfort in anything kind of sensory. So like mm -hmm. I will be sitting there with a blanket with something hot. Um, I'm even, I'll even turn the air down in our house just so I can sit with a blanket because I just love having that comfort. So um, hobbies, other hobbies would be um, playing with my dog for sure. I started getting into puzzles, which cool. I don't know how that sounds, but it's, it's fun. <laughs> Um, actually for my birthday, my husband got me a, he made a picture that we took at big bend and put it into a puzzle. And oh, cool. so I've started working on that. Yeah. How fun. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, another maybe difficult question or maybe not. How would you define happiness? It is a little tough. Um, it is and it's not. I would say aligning with yourself and living in your true nature as well as finding or being in places that make you laugh, find joy. Um, but I think really being comfortable as much as possible, right. With yourself because mm -hmm. we're human and we're not perfect. Um, living, living in your true nature. Mm -hmm. about happiness totally totally agree with that couple vulnerable questions as if this whole thing hasn't already been vulnerable <laughs> um what is the most embarrassing moment you have had as a clinician <laughs> apart from stumbling over my words because i do that often um <laughs> There was one time where I completely did not show up for a session. And this is when we were meeting in person. Um, my count, my two calendars did not sync up. And literally, I just wasn't, I was late, didn't have anything going on. I was probably just sitting at home. I just did not show up. And I felt so embarrassed. Um, but luckily, the client was very gracious. And I am been still working with her. So... <laughs> I hate yeah. when stuff like that happens. <clears throat> yeah, it felt so bad. I know. Once I double booked myself and then both clients showed up and I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, that was awful. Yeah. Um, okay. Next vulnerable question. I think you kind of already answered this earlier. Um, the question is, are you in therapy or have you ever been in therapy? Yes. And yes. Um, you're right. I, somewhat answered it by being in therapy in high school. But other than that, um, I've pretty much mostly been on and off in and out of therapy. I mean, I think it's integral to my growth just as a person and human, but also as being a therapist, um, I think it's really important for me to do my own work so that I can help my clients do their work. And for me, mm -hmm. therapy isn't always necessarily mental health therapy, like with a counselor. For me over the years, it's been a variety of different healing modalities. So mm -hmm. yeah. I'm always doing yeah, that. I, yeah. I like the way you, you put that. Uh, yeah. I mean, therapy is not necessarily always mental health therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else that you think would be good for a potential client or other therapist to know about you? Um, I, might have somewhat said this before, but I think in general, um, I like about myself that I can blend both like realistic and holistic spiritual aspects. Um, I am someone that is pretty down to earth. I am someone that can 
be with you through whatever's going on. Um, I'm that person that sometimes not thrives, but in a crisis situation, I'm the one that's calm trying to figure something out for someone else. That's not always the case for myself. (laughs) I will say that, Um, (laughs) but I can do that in with someone else. Um, and I'm open to many different opportunities. I'm, I'm always learning and growing. I am, I'm in a training right now. And I told myself after this one, I'm going to take a break, but I know I'm sure there'll be something that'll pop up and I'm like, Oh, I want to do that. (laughs) So I'm always learning and growing. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Grace. Thank you. No, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Next Quest Podcast. I learned something new today, and I hope you did too. Stay tuned for next week's episode featuring Sydney Kudavis, licensed master social worker, who will be discussing her area of specialty, demystifying the response and treatment of child abuse. Next Quest Podcast is sponsored by Jan Dimmitt Resources. Save yourself the time and stress of credentialing and let the experts at Jan Dimmitt Resources do what they do best. For over 20 years, Jan Dimmitt Resources has provided administrative support and credentialing services to mental health professionals in Texas and beyond. Visit their website at jandimmitt.com. That is J-A-N-D-I-M-M-I-T-T dot com or call 512-731-5725 for more information on all the ways they can make running your practice easier for you. Next Quest Podcasts relies solely on donations to keep this project going. Please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page at www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash nextquestpodcast, or you can make a one-time donation on my website at www.nextquestcounseling.com slash aboutnextquestpodcast. You can also support the podcast by liking our Facebook page. Until next question, this is Noah Garcia signing off.